code down to pound tag while on a zero five chromosome. Uh, this QR code leads you to exactly the same space. And throughout today, we will be using this space so that anyone can crowdsource our agenda just by posting questions and um, issues and whatever, and liking each other's questions. So this is like our uh, online digital space. And I, I'm really just filling in the time when I have to prepare this opening. So, uh, over to Alex. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, uh, really excited to have uh, people here. Uh, if you weren't familiar with them already, uh, we hope that this is kind of an opportunity for you to find out a little bit more about their work. Um, kind of in terms of where this is coming from, context. Uh, I'm involved in Civic Tech. Uh, I, just, for the, just to clarify. Uh, my involvement in Civic Tech doesn't uh, represent the really direct of the entire organization, but it does stand for um, what I think the Civic uh, Tech uh, philosophy of the field is in terms of having tech and participatory governance uh, by the public. Um, and uh, along those lines, uh, a couple of notes in terms of uh, ethical design. Uh, so uh, in reaching out, I definitely found that it's a lot harder obviously to reach uh, who your intentions are doing some phenomenal work that should obviously also be in the space. So that's something that I wanted to note uh, as we go in, for example, Acorn Canada, who is currently organizing a Nancy Panther on Internet, Internet for All. Um, couldn't quite make it today uh, specifically because uh, time and resource constraints. So I think um, it's wonderful to have us here and as we go forward, I want to kind of note the people that should also be here, um, but at the same time, uh, face constraints and come into this uh, space. And this is something that I was personally in, in, in the scope of my involvement with Civic Tech, it's something that I wanted to plan um, as we go. Um, so, for the participant needs, a couple of uh, recurring things that you can notice. Uh, the participant needs will be made available to uh, for viewing after certain privacy information, obviously, um, so that you can access it. What is everybody else thinking about? Um, what are some things that are on other people's minds? Um, some recurrent themes. One is uh, policy making for future planning and for the future, not simply reacting to the present. That was a shared concern at the time. Another one was, uh, in general, how does what does the EV process even look like? Of, like how we're measuring success? Is it about whether we're reaching the marginalized communities, the lower income communities? Are they being brought into the policy process? And like, what does that even look like? So those are some of the uh, more salient pieces that we saw. Uh, I also wanted to offer like a little note on uh, the. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, please just everybody. Yeah, so by now, everybody's probably uh, accessed the hack folder and crowdsource notes. So the hope is that the insect from this workshop will be readily available. And please, if throughout the workshop you have uh, friends that you would like to send this information to, please go ahead and send them. We would love for more people to find the human. Um, and I guess uh, with that, uh, just a quick icebreaker sorts of guess in the room. Who's in the room? Um, I think. I think we need to shout, right? I mean, it's kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, is it okay if we speak like this? Can everybody hear us? I mean, better? Yeah, cool, okay. Well, so, nice breaker-wise, a real simple thing, just three words, name, the value that's most important for you in terms of interacting with your community. And the third thing is about your work or your organization, um, your line of opinions. So those three words. Uh, <laughs> um, so, thanks <laughs> Alex. Um, I would say that in the line of work, I fully take this from um, the God Zero movement, uh, but really nobody is the word that I kind of want to highlight. As you can see, I'm not like, sitting here like, with like, particularly, uh, I, I continue to defer to the incredibly deep experience of all the people in this room. Um, and like for me, being like, nobody that has the Audrey and I'm really elaborate is about sort of 
even if you're not in like an institutionally embedded place, you need to draw resources and like make the connections to help contribute to the coordination problem on the work sector. So nobody would be the word, uh, third word, um, community-wise, uh, is coordination. Coordination, that's great. Okay. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Fong, and um, I'm a uh, service designer at Kitties. And the value that I hold uh, is I respect diversity and imagine a world where we can all take uh, different sides and respect different uh, perspectives from different people. And yeah, I think I just mentioned my work. So. Okay. Yeah, you're a service designer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Audrey Tang, uh, and my value is, I guess, partnership for the sustainable people and goals, which we all wear here, right? Uh, and uh, my work is digital minister. I'm a cabinet member in Taiwan. Um, so how about us just kind of take turns? Who want to start? Like, would you like to start? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, yeah. Hi guys, uh, I'm Rushal, and um, recently landed in Toronto. Um, uh, like three months back, and I work for a non-profit organization um, uh, named Livelihood Cafe. It's a livelihood project thing, so we basically, we, we have a cafe in downtown near Kensington Market here. And um, uh, we also focus in, um, in helping and settling the needs of uh, refugees uh, from Syria, Sudan, Somalia, and such uh, war torn countries. So uh, we try and help them settle here and also upgrade them in their skills, their job skills, and uh, so that they can um, do better in the future as it's all about artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's what we want to look, that, look about that in the future. And with me, I have uh, uh, my partner here. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Kamal. Uh, we both work for the same organization. It's uh, basically, uh, trying to understand the future skills uh, after 10 years, maybe after, let's say, 10 years, the people who, because of this automation and artificial intelligence, they are going to lose their jobs. Certain number of people, certain specialized, marginalized uh, sector is going to lose their jobs. Some of them, uh, some of the jobs will be transformed, but yes, many of them will lose their jobs. So we are trying to understand the future skills and what are the transferable skills which can be developed and enhanced so that you know, people down the line we don't face this kind of a problem due to automation. So that's what we are into. So we are trying to uh, do some research on that with uh, UFT students and all. So right now we have started with, uh, with a sample of uh, Syrian refugees. But we want to expand this uh, target to a broader spectrum and we are here to try and understand the, what, what kind of civic uh, organization which can you know, get you into can partner, our, like, partner with us yeah. and uh, work on these parameters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Karina Shishan. I work for the Ontario Public Service, uh, the Senior Communications Advisor. So from my perspective, the value I'd like to add is collaboration. Mm -hmm. A lot of my work focuses on working with my team to send out the right key messages and the right uh, products. I can't do that alone, so I rely on a lot of ways to do that. Awesome. But you, you get to pick, pick the next person. So. <laughs> 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 My name is Jean Tian. Uh, I'm a, pub, a public <coughs> okay. um, so in Taiwan. I work in every public department. And I'm also a junior PO, you know, from Open Government Partition Place in Taiwan. And I'm uh, very happy to see you all. Okay. And I'm Fiona. I'm here from Clio, which is Community Legal Education Ontario. So we provide uh, free uh, legal information to low-income and marginalized people in Ontario. So I guess the value that we are trying to is to be responsive to those needs, which change all the time, and to try and figure out when, how to fill those gaps, because of course people aren't able to get legal assistance I mean, anywhere near the numbers that they deserve. And so we try to fill those gaps with information. So I'm here to figure out new and innovative ways to to listen and respond to the needs of people that we might not normally be hearing from in our work. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Aurora. I'm a member of PS2, working with Audrey and all of my colleagues here. I work for the Foreign Ministry too. 
and my interests and the, the values that I believe in is helping, promoting mutual uh, understanding between Taiwan, Canada, and all other foreign countries. So my personal interest would be how to establish partnership and uh, bring international perspective back to Taiwan for Chinese people to understand what is going out, what is happening out there in the world. Thank you. Uh, hi, I didn't catch what we're supposed to say, but um, my name, name is David. By your work. <laughs> uh, my name is David. Mm -hmm. I work uh, for the Ontario government. Uh, I was on an internal website, but as of next week, I'll be working on Ontario.ca, which is the external website. Mm -hmm. And I guess the value I bring, uh, being both on the Pacific Tech as well as the uh, government fields, is for the value I want, the value I'm looking for. I don't know which value this is, but um, is the idea that. When we serve the people of, or like when I serve people of Ontario and Toronto, it's to make sure that what we're creating will actually help people mm -hmm. and won't end up causing more problems than it should. Not like first no harm. Right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, cool. Uh -huh. So who's next? So I'd say the value that I'd be sort of most interested in is that of access. It's a kind of creating that uniform access across the province to people so that they can provide that input into their government's community and use that sort of strong two way dialogue and relationship. I'm Sky Polish. I work with the government office as well. Um, and I think value that I'm interested in is how to coordinate efforts um, with different partners but also different ministries so that actually the outreach and engagement with the public is not so scattered, but mm -hmm. one that actually makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, you, you didn't quite say silence, but I'm going to write it anyways. <laughs> Um, my name is Kathleen Perkelarchi. Um, I'm senior advisor with the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long Term Care. I'm also um, a civic tech member and I work on a project called Apple Labs, which is empowering um, people facing um, homelessness mm -hmm. through technology. So I'm really interested in um, two aspects. One is how we can better engage um, citizens in the policy development process, mm -hmm. as well as how um, interested civic organizations like Civic Tech and the community can better influence uh, and partner with governments. Mm -hmm. cool. mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm Ryan. Uh, I lead a team of strategists, designers, and policy advisors in Ontario's cabinet office, which is also the government. Uh, and my, my biggest value, I think, is just curiosity. Mm -hmm. I like to bring it to the over <laughs> Hi everyone, um, I'm in the cold, so I'll try and speak loudly. Um, I'm Michael, um, I'm here in two capacities. Um, I'm here from the Moet Center, which is a public policy think tank, um, where I focus primarily on government transformation um, and associated issues. Um, and then my other capacity, I'm here as the chairperson of the Rank Ballot Initiative of Toronto, which is a non-profit campaigning organization dedicated to uh, reforming elections in Toronto um, so that we move to a, a rank ballot instead of the current first past the post system. Um, the value that I bring today, I think, is probably that uh, my understanding of, of effective governance is one where everyone who is being governed um, is able to provide their views, their perspectives to inform policy, um, and then the policy that results from that comes from the most effective compromise of those perspectives and interests. And I think that there's um, a lot of things that we can learn um, about how we can do both of those things better. Mm. Um, so that's why I'm here. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michael Chu. Uh, I work for the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office. My office is a uh, representative of the Taiwan government's interest in Toronto. So what I'm here today is to, to make sure the minister's schedule on time for today because it's a very tight schedule. <laughs> so I can be here for today. And uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to join all of you because this is a very new field for me as well. I hope I can learn something from here. 
So my work for today is to make sure minister is okay for every schedule. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Catherine. Um, I'm Michael's colleague. And I just wanted to
engagement on climate change and implementation of our climate action plan. Um, in terms of what I value and what I'm also hoping to learn from you all today, um, is like building like real genuine trust with the community um, on behalf of the government agency, trying to build those like real genuine relationships and like trying to get away from some of the skepticism that people have that this is actually listening and actually wanting to work with the community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Loretta. I'm from the Toronto Public Library. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today to see everyone. <coughs> I'm the community outreach and engagement person at the library, and we have 100 locations. And we support um, equal and free access to information, programs, and services. And I guess our values are all of those things, including diversity, inclusion, and I also want to add um, innovative approaches to uh, uh, outreach and engagement and trying new things. Um, and we try to service our local populations and um, also every Toronto and city. So um, what I'm interested in learning is civic, um, how to increase and support and encourage civic participation in the city. Um, and I'm looking forward to the day. This trend going. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> My name is Brianna Smirk. I work for the Ontario government in the Behavioral Insights Unit. We don't solve crimes. Uh, we are a <laughs> public sector consultancy. Uh, we, on the surface, we, we make low cost changes that improve public facing services and programs, but at the core of the work we do is um, try to bring experimentation more into the, the norm of how we do public policy. Um, and I guess very much along those lines, the, the value that I think I have is one of experimentation, but also doing some, those, those things very ethically and um, responsibly so that you can build that, that trust. <coughs> oh yeah, I don't do this. <laughs> out of order, I'm going out of order. Oh, oh okay, all right. <laughs> Plot twist there. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Asad uh, Chishti. Uh, it's like a soap sud, a sud. Um, feel free to ask me about the pronunciation. Um, value that I bring is uh, to the time je vous considere, considerez, basically, uh, you know, different languages, not just Perl and Haskell or English or Taiwanese or uh, what have you, but uh, I feel, I find as someone who speaks more than one language, uh, a lot of the words that get thrown around in these spaces don't mean much to me anymore. Uh, they've, you know, you can't quite call them watered down because water is life. So, you know, if we talk about the meaning of words being watered down. So language is one thing, and the other thing I think about a lot uh, is non-urban set settings and non-downtown conversations mm -hmm. uh, because Toronto, like a lot of other cities, ends up being its own universe uh, and I don't actually spend a lot of time in Toronto. Uh, and for work, uh, I'm the inventor uh, at a company called Chairs and Tables, uh, which works on multimedia research projects around what does it mean to live a full life, a good life, uh, as well as a chief librarian at a community library called Adjacent Furniture. And I look forward to having these conversations with you. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, my name is Adele Gale. I'm currently a policy advisor at the Ontario Cabinet Office, but I joined the public service to uh, work on uh, human services integration. So we design and our human services for youth who are most disconnected from those services, mm -hmm. and who we know in the long run end up costing the system uh, more. Um, my value system is meaningful engagement, and by that I mean involving people end to end, not just extracting their experiences and ideas, but really involving them from beginning to end. And within that, I'm interested to learn from you how you navigate power, because I believe that's the most important thing that's never talked about in this type of work. Um, a lot of times we throw around whether a statement is around people having power, but they really don't, right? The power really starts with the first person who decides what the question is. Mm -hmm. uh, and that question frames the boundaries of how that engagement will work out. So how do citizens and other people get involved in the process and then how do they in turn get to own the process and redefine the process for everyone else? Thanks. You want to go last? Okay. I don't care. <laughs> Hi, I'm Yun Chen. I'm from Gov Zero Taiwan is student zero fee. And we are a decentralized civic community in Taiwan. 
enrollment participants and building a tool that to uh, facilitate online discussion on popular issues. So what I care about the family here is open collaboration with the community. I hope the civic participation and or the engagement is not only initiated by the government, but the uh, community and citizens, they can have the authority to make their own agenda and uh, work in a communal way to push something forward and collaborate for against the government, depending mm -hmm. on the situation. Mm -hmm. I guess that means me. Uh, my name is Tess Nascat. I am with the Toronto Centre for Active Transportation, where I'm the project manager for a program called Active Neighbourhoods Canada. Um, and the value that I would bring is equity and building off of what some people have said. I really believe that the only way to build equity and, and outcome is to build equity in process. And so my work specifically is um, in participatory urban planning or co-design. So it's focused on the built environment and how building equity and engagement processes can lead to a more equitable built environment uh, outcome. Awesome. And we're even on time. It's <laughs> exactly the end. Um, so, should I just take the mic? Uh, and I, oh, uh, yes, I'm just uh, adding a couple words. Uh, sure. It's, sure. it's awesome to have. Uh, or, or maybe you can use the mic anyway. <laughs> and then speak up a little bit. And it's awesome to have uh, Mr. Chan here. Uh, just to wrap, wrap this up a little bit, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it, it was awesome that you guys were able to stop by on your way to Ottawa. <laughs> um, one of the most sought after people in digital government sitting right here at this table and uh like for me it's like in the world where, where like you know like it's it's like they can't get us like like i think like you actually have like a webinar coming up because like all the people in like a politico are uh, trying to like you know, the creature and um many sources actually describe audrey as the oddly uh the uncannily accessible uh a digital minister that's definitely been my uh um sort of experience interacting as well but i'm so happy to have uh you here also giving the opening uh, speech and very excited also to hear from people in general who've done phenomenal work it's amazing to see uh from a civic tech participants perspective as well like, there's so much there that uh i'm as well it's awesome too all right so uh, for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, what I will do uh, is that I will take the values uh, that everybody here seem to uh, care very much about and uh, talk candidly and frankly about my uh, personal theory of change uh, as digital minister for two years now in the Taiwanese cabinet. Uh, in particular, I would like uh, to invite you, if you have any questions during my presentation, to just uh, enter them on Slido and or raise your hand and start, you know, shouting and have a real conversation. Uh, I know people will uh, prefer Slido anyway, but uh, anyone who um, interacts face-to-face takes priority over online interaction. This is uh, the ground rule. Uh, and uh, the theory of change of my work in the Tony's cabinet is very simple and uh, it concerns about uh, how power is navigated. So I would like to uh, ask for a show of hands. How many people here have heard uh, of the Occupy Parliament? That is the Sunflower Movement. When in 2014, we occupied the Taiwanese Parliament for 22 days. Uh, have anyone heard of it? So like half of people here. OK, so uh, then very quickly to kind of set a scene, uh, I will um, talk a little bit about how that happened and how that leads to a different kind of policy making. Um, and so, traditionally, as, uh, as we know, um, many um, public issues are framed. Um, is it even working? Uh, no. Hey. Okay, <laughs> it's framed like this. Uh, you have people caring about maybe economic development, caring maybe about environments, caring about various sides of things. And the government is structured so that we have a council or a ministry or whatever, um, like the months, yeah. Uh, and people just apply pressure uh, to whatever part of the government that they feel most connected with that share their value. And the uh, career public service being this kind of invisible line uh, in, in between absorb all the tensions. Uh, and, but this kind of worked uh, in the last century. But in this century, um, it doesn't work anymore for two reasons. Uh, first, we don't need a counselor or a traditional media to organize people at all uh, with the right hashtag. 
uh, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people can just organize among themselves, just fine. Uh, and the second thing is that there's just too many emergent issues. And for emergent issues, there's no line uh, in the government that is already working. So you end up with a more siloed processes where in the emergent issues, nobody is pretty sh is sure of what, what to do at the time. And so um, we've, uh, in the internet society, which is the community that I grew up with, when I was uh, 15 years old, uh, that was 1996, I dropped out of uh, the second year of junior high school uh, because of this new invention called the World Web. I just told, told my teachers that uh, new knowledge is being created on the World Web and you know my textbooks are all out of date. And so I asked my teachers <laughs> that I really want to drop out of junior high uh, and, and if they're okay with it, and, and they're okay with it, which is why I have this much optimism about bureaucracy because uh, I, I believe that if you get a right uh, lines of reasoning across, then people can actually switch to a different governance model uh, and to the benefit of everyone. And so this is the kind of uh, governance structure that I learned as a 16 years old in the internet society. The internet itself is being governed in a way what we call collaborative governance, meaning that people may have different values, may have different interests and so on, but through a radically open conversation, people can discover common values and deliver innovations that leaves kind of no one behind. But back in 2014, there was an uh, interesting demonstration of the collaborative governance values and radical transparency in Taiwan. Uh, for 22 days, we occupied the Taiwanese uh, uh, parliament. And basically, that was because the MPs at the time refused to deliberate substantially the cross strait service and trade agreement with Beijing. Uh, there's a constitutional reason, because they think Beijing is the domestic city of Taiwan, and so they don't have to debate it like other uh, trade service agreements, uh, but that's besides the point. The point is the MPs were on strike. And so people went into the parliament and did their work for them because they were on strike, right? So that's the legitimacy theory. Uh, and the demonstration is not protesting. It is actually a demo in a kind of software demo uh, idea. The idea, very simply put, is that about 20 different NGOs who occupied different corners in the parliament all debated on um, one uh, particular aspect, like labor, environment, and whatever, of this uh, cross-strait service and trade agreement. And a community called GovZero um, provided not only communication uh, apparatus, but also the fact-based conversation that you can enter your company name or anything and it shows exactly how the CSSCA affects you. So everybody starts with the same fact-based, evidence-based uh, conversation and share their feelings to the 20 or so different NGOs. So every day in the Occupy, people converge a little bit on the consensus and every day in the Occupy Parliament, people read out which part are still you know, unresolved and which parts are generally agreed. And so over 22 days, basically, people converge on a set of five very concrete synthetic demand, which the head of parliament then agreed. And so this was a successful law occupied because the, the power, the agenda set by community is then, um, with half a, half a million people on the street, is then taken by the head of the MP as binding. And so after that, uh, there was a mayoral election at the end of that year, and everybody who supported the Occupy gets elected. Uh, sometimes, so surprisingly, they didn't even prepare the inauguration speech, and everybody is, who is against open government uh, lost the election. And so that kind of uh, set a new tone of Taiwanese politic in saying that um, at the end of that year, 2014, uh, the new premier basically said uh, crowdsourcing open government is just going to be the national direction uh, and there's no turning back. And so um, for the past four years or so, we've been ranked consistently like the top or the second place uh, on say open data, citizen participation, inclusivity, broadband as a human right and things like that. And so it is a drastic change that we're uh, already in for four years. Uh, we're still pretty new at this, but we would like to share uh, the kind of uh, power theory and power structure. And so that brings to what does the Gov Zero actually mean? Um, Gov Zero is, is a meme, it's a kind of virus of the mind. It, it says very simply, if there is any government service, which in Taiwan always at an NGO, the TW. And so, for example, if you don't like how the legislative UN, uh, you know, uh, pro promotes its website. If you think uh, the national budget is too hard to use, then you basically, instead of you know just protesting on the street, anyone can just build their own version of the website just by changing an O to a zero. And so there's no discoverability problem. You don't have to uh, pay Google or Facebook to advertise your website because it's the same as the government website, only by changing an O to a zero. 
on the website uh, address, everybody can get to the shadow of government for free. Uh, and because, <laughs> because of this, uh, there is hundreds of projects, each uh, offering an alternative version of government's website. The very first one, Budget G0 BTW, offers the visualization of the national budget, and everybody can drill down to one particular part and have a real-time conversation with the public service involved. But the best thing about Gov0 is that the zero here also stands for Creative Commons Zero, which means abandoning, relinquishing copyright. So everybody who participates in the Gov0 basically relinquish most of their copyright. So on the next procurement cycle, if the government thinks it's a good idea, then this shadow website actually gets merged and becomes the official website. And so this is basically uh, innovation without permission, but then with a uh, ultimate aim of being merged back as kind of a standby government. And so the, uh, the budget of GSW, which is the first prototype, gets merged last year as join.gov.tw. So all the 1,300 different government projects, including the KPIs, procurement, spending, research, whatever, is visible uh, as a social object, with one project being its own URL for people to have a real conversation with public service. And last week, uh, I think of Zero Italy just launched. And because this is not trademarked or patented, everybody is free to launch their own. G0, the uh, alternative service. So that brings me uh, to how I was kind of uh, uh, working with the government as the understudy minister. Uh, because um, in 2015, at that time, there was a interesting worldwide issue uh, which calls itself sharing economy, uh, but it means very different thing to very different people, and Uber being one of the primary vehicles pun intended, to carry that sharing economy uh, virus of the mind. Uh, so um, in the UberX package, very simply put, it says um, code, dispatch, cars, better than laws. So we need to follow code, not laws. So that was kind of the payload back in 2015. Uh, so it is spreads from drivers to passengers to driver to passengers and if after driving for, for UberX uh, without a professional driver's license for a few weeks the driver found it's not a very good deal after all, they would already have spread to like five passengers. And so basically we, we cannot really have a meaningful uh, conversation with a meme um, because it's really just an idea of the mind. And so uh, at that time, uh, governments worldwide were struggling with how to actually have a real conversation or deliberation in this effort. But we thought if we can get half a million people on the street and many more online to agree on the CSSTA, surely the Uber issue is a scaled down version of the deliberation that the occupiers just did like half a year ago. And so uh, we worked with the public service to design the V Taiwan methodology, which is entirely uh, citizen initiated. And that is based on the, the, the observation that if people have seen all the sides, have listened to all the sides, and care deeply about each other's welfare, then people become inoculated against divisive public um, PRs. And so we use the focus conversation method, the starting with facts, sharing each other's feelings, brainstorm about ideas that address the most people's feelings, and ratify those ideas that are consistent. And in this way, basically, we start with people on the street who speak a different language than people you know, in the governmental apparatus, and then uh, deliver this kind of AI-powered conversation that allows people to converge on a consensus around um, their uh, findings about UberX. And the thing I want to highlight here is that actually, the truly polarizing view is always just a street minority. Even though the mainstream media and the social media focus on the thing that you know takes people apart, actually people have much more in common with their neighbors than the mainstream media would lead people to believe. And with the properly designed social fabric and infrastructure, we let people kind of have an overview effect on their own, you know, Twitter and Facebook friends and discover that they actually have much more in common than the mainstream media leads them to believe. And then we took those consensus items and put a real time live consultation with all the stakeholders and then ratified the new uh, taxi uh, laws, which is why Uber is now operating legally in Taiwan by taking in people's consensus items. And so after that, uh, I was invited from being the understudy minister to the actual digital minister. Uh, and uh, I, uh, when I did accept the post, uh, that it was in September 2016, and that uh, goes to the power navigation theory. I started a months long Ask Me Anything uh, website, and basically no journalists 
can get an exclusive interview with me. Everybody can ask me questions, but I only respond publicly. And when I respond publicly, more than 1,000 people receive in their email of my uh, uh, answers. And so point by point and gradually, we crowdsourced my job description. We crowdsourced my mandate. We crowdsourced the contact, not contract, uh, that I have with the cabinet of how I am to going to work with, but not for, the cabinet. And so um, the consensus after the months long consultation uh, is still down to three main point points. Um, it's radical transparency, voluntary association, and location independence. And taken together, those three are my theory of change. Um, by radical transparency, I mean everything, uh, not just lobbyists who, like David Cliff, who spoke for Uber at a time, uh, who meet me must agree to publish by transcript or video, or in this case, 360 videos that we can put on VR and relive the conversation, but they must agree to have the entire transcript published after 10 days. And even for internal meetings that I chair, I also publish everything after everybody uh, gets a edit uh, so that you know we sound professional, but uh, substantially the, the why of context of policy making before the policy is rolled out to people is published by essentially having everybody taking the perspective of a digital minister and see my day-to-day -day work in exactly the same order, sequence, and content as I see. So this is like putting on a VR class and be in my position. So digital minister, Shu Wei Zheng Wei in Mandarin, uh, digital also means plural, Shu Wei as in many, so a pluralistic uh, minister, that's the radical transparency part. And the voluntary association part is even more interesting because I take no orders and I give no orders. Everybody in my office is voluntarily joining from if every ministry. I agreed uh, with the general secretary to poach at most one person from each ministry. And so basically everybody um, can volunteer to join uh, here, uh, and uh, but no more than uh, one per ministry. And so theoretically I can have 34 staff uh, because we have exactly 34 um, ministries in the national government. At the moment I have 22. Uh, but this brings a very different culture because I don't give them orders. So everybody has to ideate about the possible things that they bring. And we enable this by the third uh, pillar, which is location independence. Location independence has two meanings. The first one is that we have a one virtual workspace powered by this uh, technology called Sandstorm. And Sandstorm is an open source cybersecurity hardened uh, attacked by the top notch white hat hackers for half a year uh, who can say, you know, this is really secure. Um, and it includes all the open source free software community collaboration tools which is like uh, Dropbox, like uh, Google Spreadsheet, and like uh, Google Doc, or like Trello, or like Slack, or like whatever. Every single one of which has free software counterparts. And we install those counterparts in the national government, free for all the public service to use. And anyone can also write their own application without caring about cybersecurity, because this is handled by this platform layer. And so just by having this platform layer, uh, people in my office, for example, they volunteer to write a app that orders lunch together and things like that and plan trips together or whatever that solves their ad hoc needs and there's no need to have cybersecurity audits for those new apps at all because it's handled by the underlying system. So every time I wake up and you know, just like here in Canada and so on, I just go on our Kanban board and see exactly where and what, what people are working. And the second thing of location independence is that in each ministry, we now have a team of PEOs or participation officers who are empowered to talk with any emergent issues uh, that's raised from civil society by e-petition or by any other means. And so these people carry the same cross-silo working ethic and um, the same uh, rocket chat, which is like the chat channel, and share all the documents, the processes, and so on. Uh, and so basically, they act like the digital minister, but in their own ministry. They don't take or give orders either, but they're building very deeply a culture that values collaboration by basically saying, if we can get everybody to the same table and being radically transparent, there's a much higher chance of arriving into something that is of common good of everybody. So this is like the perimeter uh, structure. 
And now in the municipalities, like the Tainan municipality, they're also having a participation officer team in each bureau and department as well. So that enables a direct correspondence between the participation office on the national level and on the municipal level. And so basically, previously, they will uh, depend on the political will of the mayor, but now everybody can set the agenda on the domestic level and transfer it to the national level, or vice versa. It becomes a truly bi-directional relationship between the two teams of EO, and that, again, is uh, a theory of change. And so the end result, and I'll get back to this line of questions in a minute, <laughs> The end result is that I can work anywhere, right? So this is my office uh, in Taipei. It's the Social Innovation Lab, uh, and it's co-created by hundreds of social entrepreneurs. The soccer field is drawn by people with Down syndrome, who turn out to be excellent artists. And every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., I'm physically there. Anyone can just talk to me, like homeless people, people who work on you know, refugees and things like that. They can just come and book for 14 minutes of my time, or just walk in and just have a dinner or lunch with me, and provided that they agree to have the transcript published after the fact, after 10 days of editing. And so the whole idea is that the space itself is mutable. It opens until 11 p.m. every day, uh, and it has a kitchen, it has a resident chef, and so we basically enable this kind of co-creation, so people who want to test autonomous vehicles that are self-driving tricycles can just use the space to show what everybody, you know, how AI feels like, and it's open innovation so everybody can change the code of the AI. And people um, in your uh, value map, people, a lot of people care about, but what about non-capital, like non-Taipei uh, cities? And so, which is why I actually tour around Taiwan uh, every other Tuesday or so, and live, live actually uh, for a night or so in the most rural or indigenous places and in remote islands and so on. And so here is Hualien, uh, the east of Taiwan. And when I meet with the social innovators there, maybe the people who are even more remote, like Taidong, can teleconference in. But all the 12 ministries, as I mentioned, is still in the social innovation lab. They see through my eyes, through two-way broadcasting, what the life is like for those people in those uh, rural places or indigenous nations. And if they raise any questions, Traditionally, uh, in, in the previous battle days, uh, the, their respective bureau would say, I'll have to talk with three other ministries before getting back to you because all the social issues there are structural in nature. But now, because all those three ministries are in the same room and they just shared pretty good food or whatever together, they're in a more relaxed uh, social fabric to brainstorm about possible solutions. So basically, um, two weeks after each question is raised in this way, me being the facilitator, they have to either respond point by point and resolve the question on the spot, or they, they will say, this requires social entrepreneurship to fix, and social entrepreneurs can cite this as example to enter the sandbox system where they get to violate laws and regulations for a year and make sure that it's for the common good. And if it's a good idea by the society, then it gets merged back into the regulatory system. So this is why we call regulatory co-creation and the regional innovation system. Again, it's powered by this location independence, voluntary association, and radical transparency ideas. So we have seven minutes, and <laughs> we'll see if there's any um, questions from Slido. But first, any questions from the audience, since we say the audience has priority before we get into the slide of questions. No? Okay, well, then Sorry, let's, yes. Um, how did the other ministers in cabinet react to your... Uh, uh, compact. Energy? Yes. So, uh, because it's voluntary association, I don't go to the Minister of Defense and say, tomorrow you're going to do things my way. No, <laughs> it's not like that, right? People bring to me issues that they think are wicked problems that they don't have other ways to solve. But if they think they're just doing fine in the Ministry of Defense on whatever thing that they're working on, I don't even know about it. So, so this is basically like a policy lab, an innovation lab within the government. People bring to us the thing that they think are too wicked for them to solve. But if they think the old power is still working really well, they don't even bring it to their attention. And it's the same for participation offices. Basically, the POs choose the topics they work with voluntarily, so I don't assign the POs the thing that they work on. What about feedback coming from citizens that you interact with every day? Yes. Is there any feedback you can hear from them that may not yes. apply to you directly, but to other persons? Yes. And how yes. do you relay that? 
Very much so. So um, by way of a uh, comprehensive e-participation uh, platform, the joint GOVTW platform, uh, of the 23 million people in Taiwan, uh, 5 million is active on that platform, like one quarter of the population who has to do better, but they have a kind of rolling feedback uh, mechanism on that platform. So anytime they think a piece of data is missing, or a uh, procedure is not fair, or whatever, they just uh, point by point uh, ask that on that platform, and we have a monthly review system where all the participation offices look at the most commonly pointed out structural procedure issues, and we fix them. And our monthly meetings are all also radically transparent. It's published online. So basically, we get suggestions from all over the places by just people reading of our discussions and pointing out the shortcomings of our methodologies. So this, again, is by radically trusting the citizens first. The system doesn't have to trust that, but some of them do. Yeah. Any other? Yes? Um, can you uh, speak more about the, the regulatory sandbox? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Sure, of course. So, um, yeah, uh, well, there's two slide questions, so we'll uh, reserve like two minutes for them. Um, yes, uh, the regulatory co creation, very simply put, is that you go to this one stop website, sandbox or GTW, and uh, cite as an example of a common social or environmental or local development problem that you think that current regulation or law is uh, a impediment to it. And then you say, I want this law or regulation to be changed to this way because I think this will benefit the society better. And that's all you need to do. Um, in uh, geek speech, this is a, a patch or a pull request, meaning that I want to take it to a different direction and in order to make something better. And this has to be public. Like, this is not in treatment or lobbying. This has to be a social object for everybody to discuss. And then a uh, sandbox team of pro bono lawyers and designers and whatever look at your proposal, talk to you, and channel you to one of those, uh, um, because we're a continental law system. So to break the law, you require a law that authorizes you to break the law, to make an exemption of the law, right? This is what continental law system uh, does. So if this concerns platform economy, like you want to rent your private parking spaces, but uh, just eight hours or less a day without being charged as a parking lot, uh, then that's the National Development Council's platform economy. If you want to experiment with AI-based banking that uh, you know assigns credit to people who have not even engaged with the banking system before by their telecom bills or whatever, then you talk to the FinTech sandbox. Um, for example, if you want to experiment with innovative vehicle that drives itself and that drives and flies or sails and then goes to the land or whatever, uh, then you talk to the Ministry of Economy. Um, so it's not Ministry of Transportation because they can only regulate the thing they know about. But the Ministry of the Economy, for them, all of these are the same. Uh, and so basically, as long as you can say, you know, this hybrid vehicle solves every local transportation need, you can apply for one year to break existing laws to have a test of your idea there. And of course, it has to pass like security, cybersecurity, uh, privacy by design, and things like that, <coughs> the usual regulatory uh, guidelines. And there is something that you cannot experiment, like money laundering and or fund funding terrorists. But otherwise, <laughs> everything is fair game. <laughs> and so um, in your uh, experimentation proposal, you're given one year and one cooperating municipality uh, to try. Uh, and then if it goes well and it scales up and you can try for another year on another municipality or for a larger number of people, but at the end of it, everybody does a multi-stakeholder conversation and decide whether this is a good idea or not, or whether part of it is a good idea or not. If it's a good idea, then it gets merged back and the regulation gets changed after 60 days of public commenting. If it's a law change that requires the MPs, they can take up to three or four years to change the law. But meanwhile, you essentially put a monopoly because you can continue to have that experiment while the MPs deliberate on your idea. And once the MPs are done with that idea, then of course you'll have competitors and your patch uh, is then merged back into our uh, national uh, law structure. Uh, and it's not a good idea if the society thinks it's really a bad idea. And then we think the investors are paying the tuitions for everybody because it's open innovation, all the data, and the reason why it's not considered a good idea is public information for everybody. So the next innovator will try a different angle without replicating the same uh, mistakes over again. So that's the idea of the regulatory sandbox. 
And so we're kind of out of time, so I will take um, this line of questions really quickly. Um, so um, after your historic taxi consultation, do you say Uber was or was not uh, legally? It is legal in Taiwan. You can now use the app to call taxis and rental cars. But every car carries with it a professional driver uh, with professional driver license, professional driver's plate, insurance, and all those the same regulation uh, that applies to taxis. On the other hand, taxi companies can also roll out their apps and they don't have to have a fleet painted yellow because if you call them using an app, you don't have to hail it uh, based on the color of the car. So basically, the taxi company also entered the competition using more or less the same Uber-like laws, and they can also do search pricing or differential pricing and things like that, and it's agreed by all the passengers and drivers uh, during a VTOW and consultation. Um, and so, how do you work with social media platform to have presence there for outreach? Um, yes, um, we do our own platform. All the binding discussion has to happen on the government platform, but we use the Facebook and Twitter and everything basically to lure people into more binding places. And there's many tricks of doing that. But basically, you know, whatever people say on Facebook doesn't count. Just only by coming to our consultation platform do can they actually ask the minister to respond to their question. That usually is sufficient to get people to migrate uh, from Facebook into our platforms for discussion. How do I stop foreign influence from infiltrating anonymous citizen feedback to shape dialogue or push a right-wing agenda? We welcome, for one, foreign influences, as long as they are constructive to the discussion. Uh, but so maybe this question is really talking about troll management or troll control. Uh, and troll control is a, a active research topic that I'm actually an expert in. <laughs> so but I, I will um, um, share basic idea of space design. Here, yeah, whenever you can uh, have an air power conversation, either through POLIS, which is the system, or Slido, which is the system we're now using, you can only upload or at most download each other's sentiments. You can find yourself among your Facebook and Twitter friends. What you cannot do is you cannot hit the reply button because there is no reply button for people to post cat pictures or whatever uh, hominem attacks. And so in this environment, it is impossible to subtract is only possible to add. And we don't look at those numbers of people anyway. It only measures diversity of opinions and feelings. It never measures the strongness uh, of people. So if you mobilize 5,000 people vote exactly the same way, it counts as nothing. And so in this kind of a diversity-oriented consultation environment, mobilization and troll control becomes ridiculously easy. Um, and so finally, um, have you been able to measure the impact? Yes. So, uh, Fangri will talk more about the impact measurement. We mostly measure how accountable each policy is, how much of a context is shared before each policy is made, uh, how many meaningful engagement, not just from the administrative branch, but also from the corrective and the parliamentary and the judicial branch. They all have their own open government systems, but the main metric we measure is citizen confidence or trust. How much trust does the citizen have? Um, the, their ability to impact the process and how much do they feel the government is trusting them. And that is our main metric. There's <coughs> one, but this is the main metric. And so sorry for being like three minutes over time, but this is my opening speech. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. that uh, experiment in a way of working. 
And there are different frameworks, methods, tools for different stages. And it would be great if we can find a common language to clarify different stages. So we can leverage those approaches and learn it better. And we are hoping to build things people can build on. So that's why um, I would like to invite you to um, co-create on this piece together to, in the beginning, the workshop and to see like what are the stages in the framework that we can all understand each other so we can build things up. So because today and tomorrow we will focus on the process of peer network collaboration um, process as well as the one process. So I will briefly show you um, the diagram of two processes and it might, it might look uh, a little bit uh, compl complicated, but uh, we will figure that out. So just give you a brief introduction. Uh, Peel Network is a network of around 70 civil servants in the central government. And the Peel Network serves to drive culture change. It plays a key role in Taiwan's open government scene. Peels are deeply involved in the conversation with civil society and government divisions. By tracking cross-government issues, which wider stakeholders openly and creatively. And B Taiwan is an experiment that prototypes an open consultation process for the entire society to engage in the rational discussion on national issues. So how can we leverage those different experiments and practice as a learnings? So um, our team is working on the the clarification of the terms for different stages. So if you can see um, the black dots, it's the stages that we define that we find it can be uh, easily um, respond and understand by people from different disciplines. So events, so the first stage is event. There are so many things happening in the world and when we go to the stage of noticing, because noticing stage is depends on our allocation of attention. We have different experiences and different sources of information. And those information will build on how we see the world and how we react on certain things. So the difference between event and noticing is event you don't select, you know, it's just things that are happening. But when you start to notice certain things, then we start to change the way, the starting point of how we make decisions. So that's why we want to separate these two stages to clarify the difference. Then proposal. So once we have certain allocation of attention, we will start to, to act on certain things. It can be a small proposal, it can be a big proposal. So once we reach the proposal stage, it will, it will turn into a, a general agenda setting where sometimes we select the priority of the government or the priority the civil society is going to protest or argue about. Then the next stage will be research preparation because once we get an idea of the issue that we want to work towards, then we need to start understand more about the context around the issue. So research preparation will be followed by the general agenda setting. Then once we prepare the research stage, we need to collect more data based on different issues. Once we collect the data, we need to structure that and analyze those data. So make sure we understand and being able to synthesize those information sensibly. Then we reach to the point where framing. Framing is a very important part because sometimes people find it um, there are issues they want to work towards and then they find a solution really quickly. But without going through the stage of research preparation, data collection, and data structuration analysis, they wouldn't be able to understand the, the context of the issue holistically. So once we reach the previous stage, then we can frame a better question that leads us towards the 
so uh, development part, which is um, we will generate possible solutions based on the question that we frame. Then during the development stage, we will be able to build, test, learn, and iterate that through our process. Once we feel we are happy about that, then it will go to the delivery stage where things got deployed. But this is not the end of the process yet. Evaluation is very important, and those, um, those things can go back to any stage where you feel it is needed to. So those are the stages that we think is extremely important um, in the either service improvement or policy making process. And this is, this is um, the framework that we want to suggest and we would like to cooperate with you guys so that we can build certain things um, together. So for example, we can say, oh, during this stage, uh, this is our approaches and our experiment, this is our learning, so we can easily leverage our learnings together rather than using different languages and not being able to share our knowledge efficiently. So if we look this back to the top of the line, that will be the process of peer network. And then this is the process of Taiwan. And if we, if we put them together, um, you will be able to see the difference and the approaches that each, um, each initiative take. There might be different um, terminologies towards different practice, but with, in this framework, you will be able to see, oh, this process is actually respond to your process, and this is your approach, and this is my approach. So in this stage, we can learn this from each other, things like this. So, uh, let's complete this uh, together uh, in the following two days. And if you have any questions, please raise uh, any points during the, during the workshop. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the time. We, 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 we are still having a few uh, minutes towards the coffee break. Mm -hmm. So is there any, any questions or any reflections? Thoughts? Yeah. Do you find uh, that you're ever under pressure to, to speed up the, those first research prep, data collection, and structuring parts of the process because of either political timelines or, you know, because I just from sort of past experience, often people talk about doing that with that report, which is so important, but then when it comes down to it, they're just pushed to go into idea framing it and action it really quickly. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> but um, mostly, I think, uh, when we get pressure from the legislators or from the premier, all they want is a clear timetable of what happens when. Right? This is like, um, you know, nowadays, actually Uber is a great example. When you call an Uber car, uh, you don't actually expect it to be summoned in the next minute to your door. But it's just exactly where it is, which is the main selling point of Uber. And now lots of Uber alternatives like Co-ops in Taiwan are adopting the same uh, approach because all, all people care is where exactly we are in this process. But before, uh, in the bad old days, uh, people only know that a policy is being developed when it's being user tested. That's way down there in development or even when in delivery is done. And so people aren't have, having no clue that uh, uh, public service do all these things. And so when we get the pressure on time, we basically just say, you know, these things are going to happen and you are welcome to join if you're a protester, if you're an MP or whatever, we have our next co-creation meeting next Friday, please do, do join. And that usually just makes them happy because they just know uh, where we are, there's some way for them to be involved, and then they know exactly like two months after this, there will be a consultation that takes it to the framing process, for example. And so once the roadmap is shown and with a pre-agreed date, I think people generally are okay with it. But if it's blurry, then of course we get insistent pressures from all, all over the world. Uh, we've had a question. Yeah. Just wanted to clarify what PO meant. Yeah. For participation offices. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have a connection to just the roadmap? Do you 
publish a, a roadmap, or is there an internal um, within the government to roadmap? We do, we do. Um, and so for e-petition uh, based um, projects, um, the very first uh, response to an e-petition, which requires 5,000 people for the ministries to give a point-by-point -point response, the very first uh, response to those 5,000 people through email is exactly what will happen next. So, so the roadmap is always the first communication. And then it happens according to the dates on that roadmap. And so uh, if we have a pretty popular petition uh, of 8,000 people or 16,000 people or whatever, these people then serve as kind of our ambassadors because they will share with their friends and families whenever there is a point of involvement. They can just ask their people to come and join in. And so that's particularly easy with e-petition-based uh, forms. Uh, for other incoming sources, we have other communication methodologies, but always we begin with the roadmap communication. When people are interacting with the government online, um, is there um, uh, a verified identity that they're using to interact with? Yes. So uh, we choose intentionally a pseudonymous uh, approach. You have to verify through SMS uh, a valid cell phone number, and you have to verify through email a valid email account. You have to have both. Um, but when you post, you can choose to appear under any name. Uh, so it doesn't have to be your real name. Uh, and this is under, like, we deliberated on it for like two years before arriving to this point. Because when there's power imbalance or people are revealing something that is, they feel are, uh, would put them in danger, of course they don't want to reveal their true name. But on the other hand, if we allow creation of 50,000 email accounts, then of course it renders this whole process useless. And so we, we converge on this particular um, um, kind of pseudonymous arrangement. interested in the kind of debate that happens with the framing because as you said that sounds like where it really gets interesting because at this point it feels like people don't even agree on facts anymore and I love the way you framed it earlier that we have facts then we have emotions we have to agree on a common set of facts which sounds logical but we all live in the world where we know it and there's no agreement anymore on facts everything is polarized maybe this isn't as much a problem in Taiwan as it is here but I'm just curious when someone tries to shape the framing and that's when the real debate happens. Yes. How does transparency play in the government's role yes. in making the question easier on them? Yes, so we had a petition, 8,000 people strong, to change Taiwan's time zone to GMT plus nine, uh, which is the same as Japan. Uh, and we have another counter petition, 8,000 people strong, that says Taiwan should remain in the time zone of GMT plus eight. And you can't get more political apologists than that. It's 16,000 people all feeling very strongly about the time zone of Taiwan. Uh, and so um, what we did uh, is in the fact-finding processes, because in the joint platform, in the petition platform, people use like Slido. Uh, you have, we have a pro column and a other like com column. Anybody can post any supporting uh, rationale, and people can only upvote uh, and downvote. They cannot reply to each other. So if you see a supporting argument uh, and you really want to refute it, you cannot attack that person. The best shot you have is post something on the other column and mobilize people to vote you up. And, and that's the, it, it's very civil in, in a sense because you cannot be not civil <laughs> in this framework. We took it from uh, Peter Reykjavik from Iceland. Uh, and so basically, after that, we see the top arguments being like changing the time zone, it saves energy, it attracts tourism, uh, whatever, it, it increased, I don't know, it reduced congestion. <laughs> you, have, you have a lot of you know, proxy uh, uh, rationale uh, to support the time zone change. Uh, but then all the 10 ministries coordinated by the Ministry of Interior actually responded by open data and evidence of exactly how much energy will be saved if we adopt daylight saving times or change one hours into the future. Uh, everybody responded how it will impact tourism based on tourism calculation models. Uh, and it, it will not unless people overwork and break the labor law. And, then, and so on. <laughs> and so each ministry provided real hard evidence based on the some, somewhat jokingly uh, things that people put forward. And it, uh, all the petitioners who came to the collaboration meeting told us they never expected the government to take them so seriously. And so people then generally agreed that yes, there will be a large upfront cost 
and there will be a somewhat large recurring cost if we do change the time zone. And then we ask, given this cost involved, which is hard evidence, right? Uh, do all the size of the people think there is a better common value that we can shuffle those money and resource and time to? Uh, and then both the pro and con people who came to the uh, framing meeting agreed to reframe their common value into how do we make Taiwan to be seen as more unique in the world. And that is the common frame that both the pro and con can agree on. So instead of saying compromise, like let's change half an hour into the future, <laughs> we, we actually, based on the fact and the feelings, lift everybody up to a more common universal value. And people then generally agree, even the people who petition for the change, see that you know there are countries with multiple currencies. There are countries with multiple time zones. It doesn't make Taiwan that unique. It will maybe take 15 minutes of international news and then everybody forgets about it. Yeah. Uh, and so um, if we want to make Taiwan seen as more unique, maybe we should work on open government diplomacy. <laughs> maybe we should work on many other things, cultural, human rights, whatever. Uh, and then uh, because we already commit the resource, so all the ministries say, okay, now given the resource we have, we're able to deliver on this new common value. And this is sent to all the 16,000 petitioners through email. And so this basically depolarizes people. People thought they feel differently, but they actually feel exactly the same if you look at all the evidences and feelings. There's many other cases like this, but I think this one is the, the most charged one <laughs> that I can think of that's best resolved by the PO network. almost on time, so if there's no other questions, um, during the coffee break, uh, we would encourage you to uh, choose a table that maximizes the number of strangers in the same table, so that like maximize diversity. If you are sitting next to someone that you already know very well, we would encourage you to split to different tables, uh, and so that when we talk about the framing exercise and things like that, it will be an authentic experience, because that is how the PO network works. Out of 5,000 petitioners, if we invite five people to join, it will resemble all walks of life. And if they, for example, say, oh, but I want to bring 50 people from our association, we ask, do you actually have only one single viewpoint? They're like, yes. And we're like, no, you can only bring one person to the table. Uh, everybody else is welcome to join the town hall and have a uh, collaborative uh, watch on the live streaming. But in the multi stakeholders discussion, every person brings a different perspective which is why we would like people on every table to maximize diversity. Uh, and if you come from the same organization, please do uh, split up uh, during the coffee break. So the coffee break is until 11.10, I think. So enjoy the coffee and... Yes. Yeah, please. So, um, did anyone, everyone get the link from the Slido? of the headquarters, so we put all of the materials and links, the sources uh, on this headquarters. So you will be able to see um, the information from the left hand bar, uh, which we have process notes, and this this is the benchmark that I just shared. So feel free to leave your comments and your suggestions, and we would like to use this document to crowdsource the tools that you already have. So you can, can expand further if you like if you click day one, you can do Oh yeah. So if you click day one, you will be able to see all of the materials from day one. And day two as well. Yeah. If you're on a mobile phone the folder is on the upper right corner. I'm writing a crossword Yeah. Okay. Yes. Because I find it's taking notes. Apparently, so all your values are captured. <laughs> yeah, over, over here. Yeah. Welcome to add. Yeah. 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 Yeah.